namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Aparuta de Sangamatasa Tawara Ye Sodawanta Bamunchan Tu Satang. So this evening is the new moon night and uh, getting closer to the uh, winter uh solstice and i will be going to ajan panyasaro and i'll be going to thailand in uh, next week so i won't be here for the for christmas new years or the first month of the winter's retreat uh, because of other obligations and i have a chance to go visit uh, uh, where I used to live in Malaysia in Sabah in the North Borneo, which is uh, I was before I became a monk. So that I haven't been there for 45 years, so that'll be interesting. 45 years ago, I was young, <laughs> and I'm going with two. Uh, uh, with two friends who were in the Peace Corps with me at the time, and they were even younger. But now we're all old or elderly. <laughs> and seeing how things change in 45 years. 45 years, Saba was, um, had just been released from the oppression of British colonialism. And, uh, given liberty by being joined into the Federation of Malaysia. <laughs> and so uh, Sabah, Sarawak were two British colonies on the island of Borneo. And I remember the, the kind of exoticness of going to Borneo and uh, with still the idealism of the American Peace Corps at the time of President Kennedy. And so I'm visiting that, uh, see what's happened to, I hear it's changed considerably since 45 years, especially at this time, is the changes everywhere. In Thailand, I've noticed uh, uh, when I first went to Thailand and what it is today, it's so different, society, uh, Bangkok is uh, totally changed from 45 years ago. And so we're at a time where this kind of relentless change is taking place, modernization or globalization or whatever isation you want to name. It uh, seems like the inexorable march of time and change, which is, of course, uh, what, what the Buddha was pointing to. The old conditions are impermanent. And so this is, this is not, you know, this is what I encourage uh, you to do during this winter's retreat, during this time, to keep reflecting on change, you know, just how things change in, in your own way, your, your thoughts or moods or sensory impressions, emotional habits. Just in the, it's the changing of the seasons or the uh, winter solstice. All these things are, all these are experiences that we, we have here and now that we refer to as investigation. Now this word investigation is a very significant one in Buddhism. And I think this is what draws many of us to uh, the teachings of the Lord Buddha because it is one to investigate. It's not not one to just accept point blank on faith or belief. And this 
this is uh, this is what attracted me anyway. When I, what attracted me to Buddhism was just this opportunity to investigate, to look into uh, the experience of consciousness of being alive. And the mystery of life, you know, still even after all these years of monasticism and investigation, you're not expecting to to find anything in the way that you expected at the beginning because recognize we're all limited by the conditioning of our minds. We have these very, uh, you know, clearly defined limitations of thought, and we've developed emotional habits through uh, the experiences of life from infancy up to the present time. So that we, we live in this realm of sensory impingement and intelligence and, and, and beauty and ugliness in birth and death. And so this is to be investigated now, this investigation isn't a matter of of uh, thinking anymore. It's not not a th- it's not like we're judging it or or trying to you know criticize it in the terms of because so much of personal experience isn't what we want or like or expect, uh, and so we we can be very disappointed, disillusioned with our lives, as we, especially as you get older, the idealism of youth uh, is demolished as time goes by. <laughs> and, you, and, you, and you can become embittered or disillusioned or disappointed with, with life because it isn't what we expect. And even in religious experience, what we hope to get out of being a Buddhist monk or nun or novice or lay Buddhist or whatever, you're not going to get what you're expecting to get out of it. <laughs> and I think this is very significant, that, that we, what we expect to get from, relig- from a spiritual life, a religious life, is one thing is some maybe some spiritual ideal that we might have some beautiful ideal we have of purity and perfection and liberation and enlightenment and so we because of that idealism itself the kind of attractiveness the beauty the perfection of an ideal uh, creates this expectation uh, in our lives in it interesting to see to to uh, fi- you know to recognize how many disillusioned religious people there are because uh, no matter how devout or dedicated you might be in your religious practice the result is not what you're expecting and so this is to be investigated this this very uh, ability we have to expect some result, something that we create. When you expect something, you're you're looking forward to some kind of, just like say say the word enlightenment. What does that mean to you? When we say nirvana or Buddhist Buddha's enlightenment, and of course, when we think about it, what is the result of trying to think about? or create an image or an I- ideal of enlightenment or nibbana or liberation. And of course, it, we, you know, it, we, we can put all the superlatives of the English language or any language onto that. Uh, it's the best, the greatest, the happiest. Uh, and it's always, you know, with the superlative uh, form of of thinking that we use, but notice that this that the Buddha's emphasis was not on creating live creating a utopia or a heaven or an ideal, but awakening to the way it is through investigating. Now the 
the paradigm for investigation is absolutely brilliant in, in, in uh, terms of just uh, form, the Buddhist uh, way of, of giving us this, this paradigm uh, uh, of how to investigate, how to use investigation or our ability to um, observe, our ability to reflect, observe, to witness, not from suppositions or expectations or, uh, or you know, through conditioned uh, perceptions that we might have about how we should do it, but by awakening to just the simple reality uh, that we can recognize through awareness or mindfulness. So, when I chant the Aparuta di Sangamantasa Taura, the gate to the deathless is open. This is the this is the the gate. This is the gate. This is the door. This is the entrance to the deathless. Amantasa Taura is is awareness or mindfulness. So this this paradigm is is actually pointing to the deathless all the time. Now, now try to conceive of the deathless. Is it the happiest, the, the brightest, the, the, the most beautiful, uh, and so forth? You know, the words deathless are you know, very strange. You know, coming back from Portugal, and uh, where... I gave two uh, public talks in Lisbon and and uh, and trying to transla- translate the deathless into Portuguese was quite a challenge for them. <laughs> they don't really have uh, it doesn't in Portuguese language it seems like it uh, it doesn't it's a difficult one to 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 translate in the way that that I'm talking about it. Usually we think of like immortality in Western culture, don't we, as uh, being born and never dying. So we talk about the immortals, uh, you know, and they're like beings. They're beings, aren't they? They're angels or or deities or gods. And and even in the Christian Jewish context, isn't it? We think of God as a you know, where, where was the birth of God or what was the beginning? And that's always a, a, a bewilderment to most Christians is, well, if God created everything, who created God? <laughs> because that's logic, isn't it? If, and God as a, as a being then is personified usually as a patriarchal figure, a male kind of superman, superfather, super being. Uh, because that's the best you can do, probably, with with form. Taking form and superlatives, where they're all-powerful, all-knowing, uh, and and that's, that's using the thinking process with its superlative uh, adjectives to, uh, to create the, 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 a defined God. But in, uh, when we talk about the deathless, you know, that is, we don't mean uh, the deathless was born and just never dies, because it's very clear that anything born dies. You know, the, all conditions are impermanent. Any uh, uh, conditions begin and end. But the deathless, and this go, then of course this is the such terms as Nibbana, or uh, Anatta, or Sunyata, or the unconditioned. Now these are, you can't imagine them. You, you can't create an image, a visual image, out of any of these concepts. They are concepts in themselves. But try to imagine the deathless. Now you can, you can create an image, a fantasy image, uh, about any any form, any shape, any color, any condition, you know, be beautiful, ugly, heaven, hell, 
uh, perfect, imperfect, right and wrong. And so this is like to investigate this where your where your thinking mind stops. So where you imagine even the word imagine an image, isn't it? This is our ability to create images, uh, to imagine something, to create images or icons or figures, uh, uh, and about God or the ultimate reality or heaven. Well, heaven inevitably becomes uh, a place that is beautiful all the time, isn't it? It's kind of, it's an ideal of permanent beauty and happiness. And that we can, we can create visions of heaven or utopia. Or of hell. We can create, you know, some of the most exciting visions are the ones about hell. Because uh, hell is more exciting than heaven. Heaven sounds rather boring, actually. Look at all the, the kind of tortures and and punishments that that you can imagine uh, creatures can suffer in hell. And then the human realm, we experience, we can experience heaven and hell within the within our, this human lifetime. At least I have, like my two years in. Uh, Borneo, uh, it was like being in heaven. You know, I was young and uh, in a beautiful place with pleasant everything. Life was, was you know, as far as, as uh, images of, or memories that I have of, of real sensual pleasure and happiness. It was those two years in Borneo. And uh, and therefore, you know, it was uh, still, you know, with all the the uh, beauty and pleasure and opportunity and good health and and so forth I had then, I still suffered. And not because of anything there. It was because of the creations, the images, the habit tendencies I'd created by the age of thirty. Uh, of just fear, anxiety, worry. I was uh, programmed to to create problems, and to and, and even though there was, you know, I never there was very little that I could blame on the environment or the people that I lived with at that time. It was due to my own habit tendencies to the way I tended to react to life and see myself in the society, in whatever society, whether it was in the States or in Borneo, it didn't seem to make much difference. I tended to create the same problems uh, that, you know, were, that were mainly images that I created out of memory. They were habit tendencies that I'd acquired because I had my 29th birthday in... Uh, uh, I was 29 when I went to Sabah and had my 30th birthday there. Now, the uncondition and the condition. Now, this is the this is the par this is the paradigm I've used over the years, because this is putting in terms that are uh, very neutral. Deathless is a bit. Loaded in a way because the the word death always implies to us a physical physical experience that we haven't had yet. That all of us are alive at this point, <laughs> and death is in the future. But when we when we get into the unconditioned, now this is like investigating just the the importance of such a word. Now it's a negation, isn't it, of conditions. So in, in just in terms of English grammar, it's, it's a negation, negative form of the condition because you can't create a positive one. Positive words always 
tend toward uh, uh, create creation, creation to to forms that are beautiful, pleasant, or ideals. And the negative, the negative one is uh, is, uh, and or we can create images of hell. But the unconditioned is is not not anything you can create. You can't imagine it. You can't uh, figure it out with the thinking process. But you can recognize it. And this is where mindfulness, why the Buddha emphasized sati sampachanya or mindfulness, and investigation. Yonaso Manasikara, investigating. Now what I'm doing right now is investigating, like just using the English terms unconditioned. The word condition is, uh, you know, somebody asked me, what do I mean by condition? Well, that's sankara or in Pali. Or it means anything that begins and ends. It means all the sensual world that we're experiencing is, is conditioning. You know, whether it's physical or mental, emotional, psychic, Whatever, you know, good or bad, right or wrong, it's all, everything then is a condition of some sort. A condition is, is impermanent. So when we, when we chant Sape Sankarani Cha, this is what I mean, all conditions are impermanent. Not as a, not as a grasping position to take, but as a, as a pointing to a way of investigating experience. So that we're looking at at impermanence or noticing changingness rather than than being uh, you know trying to control or be attached to particular conditions or be frightened, be caught in the fear or anxiety around uh, pain or death or uh, misery of any sort. So the unconditioned is what we what we can recognize here and now it's not a matter of of trying to imagine it or remember it it's just it's not something it's not a memory it's just reality here and now so what does that do you know when you try to figure it out you can't figure that one out the more you think about it uh, you'll get your brain into a real twist you'll go crazy so it's not a matter of trying to figure it out, but in in recognizing. And how to recognize the unconditioned means to awaken, observe, witness, pay attention. Not there's nothing to pay attention to. There's no thing, in other words. But there's the reality of now that we're all experiencing, but we may not recognize or even appreciate because we're caught into our own uh, attachments or views or opinions or emotions or feelings or assumptions or expectations. So it's, it's uh, in, in, you know, it's literally unbelievably simple <laughs> incredible incredibly simple and i often thought you know like the the zero uh in the number zero is it really a number it's nothing isn't it and uh, and I remember telling you about a book I'd read about zero, and the, the, that uh, this was not a discovery of the uh, European West, Western world. It was uh, originally Sumerian, and then spread on to India, and came through to the West through the Arabs. That the Romans and Greeks didn't have any zero. Now that. Really, it was rather mind blowing when you think <laughs> and that the Roman Catholic Church even considered zero the the sign of the devil because it's annihilation, 
Now that that does, on a logical sense, that it, it, logic it it would mean annihilation. Nothing it means absolutely nothing, and and that's a thought in the mind which is an extreme opposite of everything. You know, so we have everything and no thing or nothing. And that's the thinking process. In the, so there, one is opposed to the other. If you've got everything, then then no thing, no thing is. Uh, in, you want everything because no thing, nothing sounds like uh, annihilation, nihilism. It's frightening. It's devilish. It's like denying God. It's denying religion. It's denying everything. And Buddhism can sound nihilistic to a, a thinking person, to one who depends on reason, logic, and figuring things out with their intellect. Because on this is where uh, mindfulness is, is not an intellectual, it uses the intellect, but it's not any, there's no attachment to any intellectual perception. It's non-attachment. And so mindfulness, sati, and sati, in the Pali, sense of sati sampachanya investigation uh, this is openness so we can describe sati sampachanya or mindfulness as as open attention and this is something available to all of us all the time you know it's not not a special uh, event that we experience through 40 years of of hard work meditating and giving up the world it's 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 a simple the simple reality of opening and observing without any object without trying to find anything or expect anything from it how do you do that <laughs> So that's why uh, I, I, this encouragement. And so what I'm trying to do is encourage you. Uh, maybe I sound like I'm trying to convert you. <laughs> but that's not my intention. <laughs> because it's, uh, this is, you know, I've, I was listening to to some programs on the radio about you know the uh, about the na- the existence of God or atheism versus theism or and agnosticism and so forth. then all the the kind of problem intellectual problems around this and then uh, I was reading the biography of of Pope Benedict, the present pope, and of course he's a super super intellectual and <laughs> And of course, he thinks Buddhism is absolutely, you know, the <laughs> he calls it autoeroticism. <laughs> it's a kind of interesting way of looking at it, isn't it? <laughs> but <laughs> I try to figure what he meant by that. <laughs> that isn't exactly how I would describe my experience. <laughs> But also, I can, you know, like like in when we chant the uh, Dhammajaka Pawantana Sutta, say, Game Sukali Kanu Yoko Atakilimatanu Yoko. Now, Lung Pacha used to quote this all the time. When, you know, when I was learning Thai, you know, I'd, he'd be giving these desanas, and, and, uh, and then I'd hear, Game Sukali Tanu Yoko Atakilimatanu Yoko. And then, of course, this is in the first part of the Dhammajaka Sutta. Now take that, those are the two extremes. Gama Sukali Kanu Yoko in Pali means the extreme of sensual seeking heaven, wanting heaven, happiness, pleasure, security, all the best that we can imagine. Gama Sukali Kanu Yoko. Atakila Matanu Yoko is, is its opposite, you know, denial of everything, uh, kind of asceticism. And denial and uh, kind of controlling everything, trying to 
to keep everything, get rid of everything. So, so uh, Atakila Matanu Yoga can be seen as annihilationism, and then the attachment to Gama Sukali Kana Yoga is the eternal, you know, what we would in English call eternalism. So those are the two extremes. On the, using the thinking mind. Uh, just pointing to, to the limitation of thought as a refuge is that you're caught in this, in this polarization, in this uh, op- opposing of, of these opposites of, say, heaven against hell. And, and if you have God as some kind of person or form, then it has its opposite. So you've got the devil or Satan or something good and evil, one opposed to the other. And if you have right, then there's wrong, true and false. And everything that's formed has its opposite. It's just the way it is. There's nothing, we're not judging it. You notice I'm not saying anything that that conditioned phenomena is bad and we've got to get rid of it because that would be annihilationism. At the Kilimatanu Yoko. So what the Buddha was pointing to was awakening to, to conditioned phenomena and recognizing it in terms of, of characteristics, the anicca dukkanata, that all conditions have in common. They're characteristics. So this word characteristic uh, is, you know, it means that they... It's not a quality of any sort, it's a characteristic. So all conditions are impermanent, unsatisfactory, and not self. Non-self. So this is like investigating that. Till you, But then, if you're just operating from the condition level, this is where the, the refuge in Buddha Dhamma Sangha, why that's so important is that this is actually uh, a, a ceremonial form, a conventional form for taking refuge in awareness in the present. So awareness or awakeness here and now, aware of the conditions that one is experiencing. And so then we, you know, we, we're all experiencing the universe from this one point that we're experiencing in this moment, from this body. So this is, this, is the, this is the humbling part of it. Because we, in order to really open to the universe from this point, we have to, we, we can't try to become anything or, or, you know, try to see ourselves in any particular way. You know, it's not saying, I am the Buddha, I am God, I am the ultimate reality. Because that, in terms of, you know, if I start thinking in that mode, it just reinforces this sense of, of, of I, uh, I am a special person. Where refuge in Buddha Dhamma Sangha, if I use that for, as my refuge, then that's not... I can't claim that on a personal, you know, as, as mine. You know, it's not my invention. It's a, it's a tradition dating back to 2,550 years ago from the Buddhist tradition. So, you know, Bhutang Ternangachami is not kind of Ajahn Sumato's invention. <laughs> it, is a, it is something, it, but if we attach to it out of ignorance, then we still get the same result. We'll be disappointed. I believe in Buddha, I believe in Dhamma, I believe in Sangha. It will, you know, it will lead to, we won't get what we're expecting from that kind of belief and attachment. So, it's not a belief or attachment, it's a suggestion, it's a way of reflecting. So, the Buddha is, uh, is the awareness enlightened awareness here and now that we're taking refuge in, noticing the way it is, Dhamma. 
all conditions are impermanent and recognizing the unconditioned. It's, it's recognizable, even though you can't define it. It has no form. It has no color. It has no quality. But it's here and now. It's reality. Where what you regard as the real world is not real. It's not ultimately real. It can be convincing, <laughs> but it's not reality. And so, when people talk about the real world, they, they're talking about a world they create, about a world that's not real. That reality then is, is, is recognizable, realizable through awareness. And so, starting from this, from this point, zero, ground zero, awareness, awakened attention, to whatever you're feeling or experiencing, you begin to notice, just not in a critical way of judgment of how good or bad you might be feeling at the moment, it's, but it's like this. It's like embracing, embracing this, so that you, you, know, you can actually, to embrace something means you're, doesn't mean that you, you know, you're, you, you're liking what you're embracing. You're, you're just receiving something as it is, this present moment, and and in whatever form you're experiencing it, whatever qualities that you're experiencing it in, emotionally or, or physically, is like this, and so then as you kind of remind yourself to do this, this become, this will strengthen you in, in helping you to, to really look at conditioned phenomena, not from liking or disliking, approving or disapproving, but through just recognizing conditions are impermanent and not so. Suffering, dukkha, is you recognize it and you, uh, you recognize attachment to conditions is the cause of suffering. Out of ignorance, out of unawakened attention, not knowing the Dhamma, then we tend to operate from the force of habit. So we're always experiencing uh, our consciousness through our attachments, through our habit tendencies through our likes and dislikes, through our perceptions. And of course that is suffering or dukkha. It's, there's, you can't, you know, there's nothing there that, that, that is truly satisfying or, or real or trustworthy because it's all changing. And so when we're looking for perfection in the imperfect or uh, enlightenment in in that which is not enlightened for reality and the unreal then we're going to be disappointed we're going to be disappointed with, as a result so what the the kind of um, message the Buddha is giving is wake up pay attention simple as that So during this uh, this uh, uh, winter's retreat, see those of you in the monastic community, uh, you know, see this is a three month period where you're encouraged to to investigate this and whatever happens to you during this time, you know, the weather or the the uh, you know whatever happens, you know. Physically, emotionally, what memories come up? What uh, you know happens to the community, uh, or whatever. This this uh, this sense of investigating it in this way. Not who's to blame, but it's like this. 
So if, if confusion, disillusionment, disharmony arise during this, during this winter's retreat, it's like this feeling disharmonious, disappointed, disillusioned is like this. Feeling peaceful and concentrated with uh, bliss and raptures like this. So, you, you know, we, I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't experience the jhanas or bliss and rapture. <laughs> Some people think I, I'm, I'm all against jhanas, but I'm not. <laughs> but but uh, no, they're they're very very good, you know. It's, but they but attachment to bliss is it's still unsatisfactory because you can't you can't sustain it, you know. It's very dependent on on the concentration practices and things going in a way that do not irritate or cause a lot of uh, of negative emotions or irritations to you. But in the terms of mindfulness, then everything, we learn from everything that happens. Now in a community, monastic community such as Amravati, uh, it's like this. You know, so it's, this is a, a practice of not judging it of what we would like a monastic community to be, but it's a way of accepting the way it is. Now, when I do this, it, it, I, I embrace the community, the whole community. It's like this. And of course then that might bring up certain feeling of anxiety or, or aversion or preference or, or whatever because in you know when it's uh, these personal relationships living with other people that that so much of the suffering is, is, is comes from it's on the personal level Cause most you know we're all p quite committed to precepts the moral precepts and and the goal of our spiritual practices are very much the same, but the but the suffering is, you know, liking, disliking, believing, disbelieving, disappointment, disillusionment, wanting, not wanting, expecting, and then we then of course we we do affect each other in various ways. And it's like this. So this is this is the magic of mindfulness: is that it it receives everything unconditionally. So it is the foundation of you might, of metta or loving kindness. And this, I you know, when I one of my powerful insights is that 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 love in this way, unconditioned love, is the very basis. Of of the unconditioned, it's the unconditioned, and without that, the conditions would have no place to be born or die in, or begin or end in. And if there is no un, you know, if there is no unconditioned, if there's nothing there, then there there wouldn't be anything. At all, there wouldn't we wouldn't be conscious beings at this time. So, if if there's just annihilationism, then why isn't you know what what keeps it going? What holds it together? What why do human beings, in spite of all the, our horrible history of violence and war and and deception and so forth, in spite of all that that we we can point to as bad and wicked and evil and unfair and and atrocious, there's still, you know, the incredible ability for human love to manifest in beauty. 
and what what and what does beauty do to consciousness and what does ugliness do to consciousness so in this way you know we're 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 open to both beauty and ugliness because conditioned phenomena is like that it's not it's ideal is that it's i want only beauty and no ugliness but that's not the way conditioned phenomena is. So it's uh, it's not you know so ugliness is accepted within this unconditioned love or metta. of equal value, and so you've got praise and blame, happiness and suffering, good fortune, bad fortune success and failure, the worldly dhammas. And Lung Po Cha was, was emphasized this over and over again, saying both of equal value, you know, so success and failure, or praise and blame, happiness and suffering. And they call the uh, eight worldly dhammas. And this is, these eight worldly dhammas are what we experience in terms of, you know, of, living together in a community, liking or disliking, approving or disapproving, resenting, expecting, hoping, idealizing, wanting something you don't have, not wanting the way it is to be like this. All these are worldly dhammas. And so our relationship to those worldly dhammas is, is recognizing them from this position of the unconditioned, or sati sampachanya, or the deathless. And as you be, appreciate this more and more, recognize its value, then you know, one's tendency to, to seek, uh, you know, to find happiness in the condition, it, it fades out. You recognize it. You no longer feel that interest in trying to find uh, perfect or perfection or happiness or whatever in the condition uh, of, you know, sense realm or intellectual realm or ideal realms. So then our, our re refuge is in the unconditioned and which is, in our unconditioned love isn't what you expect. Like when we we think of the word love, we usually expect happiness. Like when we in the, in the use of this word in English is when you're in love, you're you're just over the top. <laughs> it's the kind of ecstasy or rapture that you can't sustain. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it happens and it's certainly enjoyable, but it's not. It's not sustainable uh, to hold that kind of of uh, feeling about anyone else, and so we we end up being disappointed if that's what we expect from 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 love. So instead of expecting, you know, and and hoping to find, you know, Prince Charming or Cinderella or oneness or f wholeness or c perfection or enlightenment or anything, just be aware, uh, awaken to the present, that, that it's all perfect at this moment, that perfection lies not in, in an ideal of it, but in the reality of now. And that love, unconditioned love, is now. And that's why things aren't any worse than they are. And that's why you're all here listening to this talk. <laughs> and, and this is so that when we let go of these delusions or the unrealities that we believe in or blindly attach to, then we recognize or realize our true nature is this. The deathless, the 
the unconditioned. So that's from my own experience of just 40, over 40 years, this, this is very powerful now. That's why I can talk like this. Because, <laughs> because it's real. You know, they say, look, this is, this is it. This is real. And then everybody, what's he talking about? And uh, because it, it, we're expecting something else. You know, 40, over 40 years in the monastic life, I, I don't have what I expected when I began. I didn't get what I was expecting. But it is, uh, it, uh, you know, the more you kind of remind yourself in this way, use this this winter's retreat, this is, a, you know, marvelous opportunity for us. To, to, you know, where, where this is your, you know, your sole kind of occupation. This investigation of Dhamma. And, and so this paradigm, the condition, uncondition, Nibbana, Sangsara, Anatta, or Atta, Atta is the self, Anatta is non-self, liberation, uh, enlightenment, um, all these all these words point to this this simplicity of here and now, Pachubanantama, Santitiko, Akaliko, Ehi, Pasiko, Upanayako, Bajatang, we chant in, a, in morning, evening pujas. So I'll stop here. Please, uh, Consider what I have been saying, you know, of how it affects you. <laughs> uh, don't believe it. Uh, I'm not trying to convert you, and it's not an Ajahn Sumato teaching. So when I hear hear that, uh, this is teaching pointing to dhammas. All I'm doing is not not mine, not Ajahn Sumato. It's just an encouragement to awaken and look and investigate. And in how this tool we have is a really excellent one, you know, the Pali teachings uh, that we have. So, I mean, it is a very, if, you, if used skillfully, if used rightly, it's, it, you know, just more respect for it than, than I ever had in the beginning. Because it is, it's a very skillful convention, in other words. And so I can see why it's been able to last 2,550 years, because it, it is something in, in us responds to it. You know, and sometimes we, when you think about it, uh, you can, you know, you can, you know, you try to figure it out too much. You end up with, you know, you hear Buddhists, talking about, we don't believe in God, and there's no soul, no self, no God, no... And it's like they're very attached to annihilationism. <laughs> uh, and that's one, one viewpoint. Or, you know, the more eternalistic, you know, forms of, you know, altruism, uh, of Mahayana or so forth, can can be very beautiful, and we still, but we're still attached to, to, uh, to, either one side or the other, and and so it's just it's not taking sides anymore, but seeing the result of attachment. Of course, attachment to eternalism will make us give us a happier life, I assume, than than attaching to the other, like thinking it's all there's no God, no soul. Uh, it's all rubbish, and uh, I mean that. When I look at when I start thinking like that, that's not a very peaceful, pleasant way to think, is it? I think old kind of Ebenezer Scrooge. 
<laughs> Humbug. <laughs> it's going to be about time, isn't it? And then, <laughs> then the other is the, it's all love. And, <laughs> and you get into being flower children. <laughs> but in... Uh, but in terms of investigation, you see, then that, that really is like an empowerment for all of us, isn't it? To say, wake up and look and find out for yourself rather than, than you've got to believe that all is love or it's all rubbish. Those are the two extremes. But then love, not to dis, disparage that, what is, what is love? And, and then I find... You know, just uh, like the word metta, or love, it translated loving kindness, or what? What is love? Love function. It holds together. You know, just on a, when people are in love, they're together, aren't they? It brings them together. And when they don't love, then they they're not together anymore. <laughs> I mean, just on a romantic level, you know. It, you know, not to even disparage romantic love, but to say that it it is a it is a sign of this power of attraction towards something where when we're in love, even on a romantic sense of that word, isn't it? Something in us wants to put the other person before our own interest. Where say selfishness is where me first and. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to exploit the world for my own benefit. Then I, you know, then there's no love in that. It's just, you know, I'm here and I'm going to get what I can out of this for myself. But falling in love, and in its positive interpretation, and even romantic, is that, you know, you you put another person before yourself. Maybe it's the first time in your life. I remember when I was 18 years old, I fell in love for the first time when I was in the university and and it was so blissful because I actually as the first time I recall caring about somebody before myself that that I put her before myself you know and uh, where before that I was still you know thinking of me and mine and getting things for myself uh, myself was the main sole interest of my life. But then there was naivete and stupidity and and then there's always this feeling of wanting this person for yourself and then the, the love's gone, isn't it? You know, if I can have this person for myself and then you start grasping and, and you... Uh, and of course, it all ends up being miserable, and then one becomes uh, a cynic about love, bosh, humbug. <laughs> but I always look at that as uh, thinking back on it as as a kind of awakening to where you know just, should I just dis it, well, it wasn't just like sexual desire; it was more than that. Because I could feel sexual desire for people I didn't love. <laughs> but <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but it was more than just that. You know, of course, 18 years old, you don't, very naive 18 at that. But the, uh, but the, but then the, then the, 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 uh, Naivete, inexperience, and not understanding what was actually happening, but reflecting back, I see what was good in that. What was, what was I value in that first uh, experience was actually felt more love for somebody else than myself, <laughs> and uh, and uh, but it did. I couldn't sustain it. Because I didn't have any wisdom, I didn't. I didn't know how to relate or how to, how to understand what had happened. So many years later, if it, it, you know, you begin to recognize this, this, uh, this love isn't something that just happens 
on uh, by accident or uh, depends on somebody else, but it's our it's reality. It's real, but it's not what you expect in terms of memory or desire. So I offer this for your reflection. <laughs>